as you can see the caption in front of you says America the Beautiful written by Dr. Ben Carson the top neurosurgeon in the world today we want to talk about keeping a spotlight on failure it is normal for members of an ethnic group to celebrate the high points in their shared history the victories over natural and man-made catastrophes are held up as proof of the specialness of their heritage black Americans however are encouraged to remain fixated on the dreariest aspects of our past Observe the typical museum exhibition or photography display devoted to black history and you are likely to find depictions of slaves in torment or photos of gory lynchings or smoldering ash aftermath of clan raids. If, now and then, an uplifting image does not slip through, it usually has been inserted only to highlight some ensuing tragedy or injustice. When it comes to blacks, one usually gets to see only the ruination, not the rebuilding, deterioration, not the renewal. It's not that the other groups have no sad stories to tell, they just lack an elite who might profit from the repeated telling of the tales of woe. Celebrating the positive has the invigorating effect of unifying the members of the group around a common set of victories, which usually become heroic myths. If we conquer that hurdle together, we can all rise to even greater heights. In the case of the American black, it is imperative to those who believe that such a wholesome state of affairs never prevail. The images of disaster and doom must be played up, for black youth especially. Not so they may appreciate the past struggle, but to condition each generation to readily accept, without question, the wisdom and guidance of the leaders. Black history is told by the black establishment to go something like this. Africans uprooted, chained, enslaved, brutal plantation slavery, oppressive Jim Crow and lynchings, then nothing but misery until the 1964 Civil Rights Act. According to this official version of our history, the black man, apparently unable to figure his way around the corner, suffered his fate in humble dejection without the uplifting benefit of integrated schools, integrated workplace, and integrated country club. Like Sleeping Beauty responding to the princess kiss, he awakened from his sleep slumber of passivity in 1964 when a government document gave him the power to intrude himself and his young into institutions already created by others. It is then that real life began. The accomplishment of blacks prior to the modern civil rights period, which is the heroic era of the leaders, must be depicted as minimal or without any real significance. Those blacks who did figure their way around corners and often very skillfully ought to be downplayed as aberrations or just lucky folk. For how could a black man, decades before, or even a century before the sacrifices of the great freedom riders hold up his head, much less be the stalwart support of his community? This tendency on the part of the black elite to use the tragedies of the race to ennoble themselves while detracting black energy away from productive enterprise was noted as early as the 1850s. Abolitionist Martin Delaney denounced Northern blacks long freed and already established in a middle class for wasting energy on examining, complaining, moralizing over the black condition instead of getting on with the business of economically competing with whites. Certainly, nobody had a clever, clear insight into what these people were up to than did Booker T. Washington, who in 1911 accused self-interested blacks of purposely emphasizing race in order to get an easy ride for themselves. There is a class of colored people, declared Washington, who make a business of keeping the troubles, the wrongs, and the hardships of the Negro race before the public. Some of these people do not want the Negro to lose his grievances because they do not want to lose the job. There is a certain class of race problem solvers who don't want the patient to get well. And indeed, years later, the patient has not gotten well. But the booming race business is healthier than ever now betrayed by a flower and other victims and oppressed groups. One of the many negative consequences of the emphasis on failure and loss is that most blacks are cut off from a knowledge of the thousands of black men who viewed business enterprise and land ownership as critical to progress and actively pursued success in capitalist enterprise. For example, over a century ago, Henry Allen Boyd, son of a slave with little formal education, founded one business after another in Nashville, Tennessee and assisted his fellow blacks to do the same. He was revered as the solid rock of Nashville's black community. 
Years ago, John Whitelaw Lewis countered Washington, D.C.'s restrictive Jim Crow laws by building an elegant hotel for blacks, designed by a black architect and built entirely by black tradesmen. It became the center of social life for black professionals and business people. Before Lewis, New York realtor Philip Payton and a partnership with black businessmen prevented the eviction of black tenants from two buildings in Harlem by buying the two buildings outright. They met racism head on with economic clout and were praised for that novel method of resisting race prejudice. Charles Spaulding and his cousin Asaph presided over the country's largest black owned business, Durham's North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, with Ace's intelligence and perseverance helping the economy survive even a Great Depression. In the 1870s, Robert Reed Church, born a slave, used his brains and savvy to become a businessman prosperous enough to counter racist laws in Memphis by building a splendid park on Bill Street for the black community. Here blacks enjoyed summer festivities, a you know, graduation exercise, and hosting an annual Thanksgiving dinner for the poor, all paid for with black dollars. George Downing, an industrious entrepreneur in the 1840s, not only established catering businesses in several eastern resorts, he, he built the luxurious Seagirt Hotel in Newport, Rhode Island. His was one of the most popular establishments in town. There's also an impressive list of black men who long before emancipation used their ingenuity to counter racism to meet racial insult with economic initiatives. What did they all have in common? They were pragmatists, men who realistically assessed their options in the world around them, learned the economic principles that drove society, and set out to master them. They did not get sidetracked or bogged down in ideological swamplands since such digression would not have created jobs for themselves or their children or produced a capital with which to subvert, subvert bigotry. It was this prevailing spirit among blacks that people like Booker T. Washington cultivated to inspire them onto even greater achievements. The men and women who led the Tuskegee, Tuskegee movement understood that just as important as the technical assistance they offered was the moral support necessary to harden even the poorest to become successful craftsmen Farmers and small business proprietors. Many men who had been mechanics and blacksmiths during slavery worked to accumulate capital so they could open mechanical repair shops and blacksmith shops. In Cass County, Michigan, a community settled by former slaves, William Powell was one of the men who opened their own companies. He was a standard repair shop where he invented or improved upon several mechanical implements. The present story of the black masses might be a very different one if the elite who usurped the manner of leadership from the Tuskegee elders had possessed the same sense of mission. Instead, throughout the Tuskegee period, these arrogant ones scorned education and crafts and industrial skills and especially derided black formers. A 1909 poetic dated by Kentucky educated Joseph Carter reflects this disdain. Carter criticized the tendency of black intellectuals to belittle the economic achievements of the black form in contrast to the elite's own college-bred attainment. He pointed out that many had experienced former earned a better livelihood than some college graduates, he wrote. A great many influent northern blacks scoffed at the small businesses that had sprung up throughout the south and other parts of the country. In fact, this disdain is still reflected today in the attitudes of most of the black leadership. For instance, in 1989, during the Miami riots, a television interviewer asked a local leader why American blacks fail to pool resources and open small business as do other groups. The response was that piddling little mom and pop stores were a thing of the past. After all, no one could expect blacks after 400 years in this country to engage in such lowly occupations. What prominent members of any other group would downplay even the simplest accomplishments of their compatriots? These are the people whom Marcus Garvey had in mind when he criticized. Negroes who lack the ability to appreciate starting at a given point and climbing steadily, while other races have been willing to start from the lowest down to climb higher up. With the passing of the Tuskegee leadership, the stage was set for the forces that would have further atomized the black community. An alliance was now in place between a band of black sophisticates and eager white liberals who succeeded in linking all future progress for blacks to the quest for equality. From this point on, any social or economic achievement that had occurred prior to the days of the glorious civil rights movement had to be downgraded as trivial or even pathetic since such achievement could not fit into the myth of 
liberation as a gift of a wise and benevolent 1960s leadership. Cut off from the knowledge of the stated progress made by blacks into the 1950s and the prudent measures taken by enlightened men and women who learned how to make economic system work for them, the black masses continue to be manipulated by a cynical elite. The solutions to our social and economic problems have always been within our reach and within the black community. Our misfortune is that our race custodians have chosen to ignore that part of our history that could have been the most meaningful impact on our lives. It is not necessary for blacks to look for other groups to learn how to utilize free enterprise to improve our lives and restore our communities. We need only to look to our own impressive and honorable past.